At the shooting of this video, I'm 38. At age 28, I went back to school. Although I had tried college immediately after high school, I failed out after three semesters. None of my old grades were good enough to use for credit, so I had to start over from scratch. My first semester began in January 2014, and in May 2018, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics. I was 33 years old. Now, I won't lie to you and say it was a walk in the park. It was obviously doable, but it was remarkably difficult. Sometimes I wasn't sure how I would even pay the rent. I once had to borrow money from a friend just to make ends meet. However, the personal and professional growth I experienced during that four year time is easily worth 10 times the cost of a typical college degree. If you're thinking about this, the first question you need to answer is why do you personally want to sacrifice four years to go to college? Seriously, why do you want to go back to school? More specifically, what do you want to get back to school as an adult for? Some people are thinking of going back to school to pursue a new career, add to their skill set, or simply get more out of life. Others have hit a ceiling at their current job. No matter what your career goals are, this video has something for you. I detail my observations and experiences being an adult in college. Now, I can't guarantee that all of my advice will work for you and your situation, but if you really want this and you're willing to do the hard work, you'll get something out of this. And if you're on the fence about going back to school later in life, being an adult, student, reading about my experiences will give you the confidence necessary to take on this challenge. So without further ado, I present to you my observations and experiences returning to school in my 30s. Number one, make sure you get into a decent degree program. Enrolling in college is a serious decision as an adult. You need to make sure that your intended course of study is worth the four years of five-figure tuition you're about to invest. You need to be careful that you're not about to enroll in a school that's just a for-profit online degree mill. These are the type of places that take advantage of adult students who are strapped for time and want to better themselves. Be practical. Don't major in the latest fad or follow your passions. You're going to college as an adult to increase your income, grow your network, and get more opportunities, not just to have a degree for the sake of having a degree. Time investment will be at least 8, 12 to 16 week semesters. These semesters will not be cheap and they will be exhausting. Here are a few ways to indicate whether your degree is worth the time and money investment. Does it have the word studies, administration, or end with ology? If yes, then it's not rigorous enough to be of any economic value. You'll be forced to get a master's degree or higher to see a return on investment with this type of degree. Since you're going back to school, I'm assuming that you don't want to spend the next four years there just to have a chance to break even. Also, on a special note that wasn't covered in that, don't get a business degree. Business degrees teach you nothing about running one. All they do is signal that you are smart enough to specialize, you weren't smart enough to specialize or ambitious enough to start a business of your own. Sorry if you have a business degree, if you have one, then you know this is true. Next, does it require you to study at least calculus one? If not, it's probably not rigorous enough to be of any economic value. It's not that a worthwhile career path will make daily use of calculus. It's just that the degrees that lead to them tend to require at least the first level of calculus. There is one notable exception is the degree in the medical field. Nursing doesn't require calculus, but the medical profession has an extremely high demand. Be careful though, as many of the health sciences have high demand, but relatively low salary. Can you get a paid internship that is higher than minimum wage? If you ever have to work for free or for a low wage, even as a student, they are quite literally telling you that your degree is worthless. Don't expect to be paid much more when you graduate. Is it in the science, technology, engineering, or mathematics? also known as STEM fields. Now, despite the National Center for Education Statistics, STEM is not an automatic guarantee of a high salary or even a high career demand. Avoid biology or anything that ends with sciences. You'll find that most of your success in this area will be fo focused on the T and the E, engineering and technical disciplines. And most of these STEM programs, they're going to have a direct career path or a derivative career path that at least generates a decent income. Many profitable paths don't require college education if you can't do STEM. You can learn a trade, become an automatic, 
mechanic, learn to code or become a salesperson. Some of the best jobs out there don't require a four year investment to get them. But if you want to go to college, then you need to figure out what to study based on the metrics above. Those student loans you'll probably need to take out depend on you not messing this up. By following the suggestions on this list, you'll prevent yourself from needing even higher education to make enough money to justify the time and money investment. Now, let's talk more about the money too. Figure out how you'll pay ahead of time. The absolute best case scenario is that you get some type of scholarship. However, this is unlikely as a non-traditional student because many schools reserve scholarships for high school graduates. However, there is always money to be found somewhere. Specific programs often offer scholarships based on merit. Many medical and teaching fields also have tuition reimbursement and loan forgiveness deals. A Google search into scholarships and other related items will expose you to everything available. Remember, any worthwhile scholarship is going to be based on merit. This means that you need to make sure that you're putting everything into each semester and getting the best grades you can. My transition from a two-year to a four-year university was much easier because I got a merit scholarship as a result of my 3.9 community college GPA. The other thing that helped was my GI Bill from serving in the Army National Guard. Now, the military isn't for everyone, but it's a fantastic way to fund your education, gain useful skills, and have a potential job while you're in school. How you'll pay your bills and feed yourself while you're in college is something Thing you need to consider. You may be able to get away with borrowing enough money to cover your cost of living, the official financial aid term, for the first two years of your journey in community college. But if your program is easy enough to where you can work a full-time job and go to school full-time without giving up sleep, then it's too easy and is probably not worth the cost and time anyway. You probably have to fill out a FAFSA, the financial aid form. This will likely go one of two ways depending on your life life up to this point. From a financial perspective, you're either a complete loser and your expected family contribution, financial aid talk for how much you're expected to pay of your tuition is zero. The other scenario is a bit of a nightmare. You've been paying a mortgage or had a respectable salary last tax year. Since financial aid is based on your tax returns of the previous year, you won't get much money, if any at all. If either of these scenarios fits, you probably aren't getting anything. At the very least, you aren't getting as much as you need. This will be a challenging point when you go beyond a two year university. Even in the best case scenario, you're still going to have to borrow money. The only difference is how much the school lets you borrow and under what conditions. Even with the money you borrow, it may not be enough to finance your education beyond community college. You will need to acquire additional funding. Now, I worked at a bank first two semesters of community college. Then I had to stop working and rely on my boxing earnings to cover my cost of living. When I stopped boxing, I started tutoring high school math and physics students. During all of this, I was still doing Army National Guard drills during the weekends and collecting that pay. Even with all of this, there was still a point where I had to pay about $1,000 out of pocket. American education is not cheap, so it's important that you go back to school for something that will make you employable. You need to be reasonably sure that your degree program will lead you down a career path where you're going to make enough money to at least cover the monthly repayment cost of any financial aid you get. Everyone talks about forgiving student loan debt, but when I filled out the FAFSA paperwork for my financial aid, there was a lengthy section I had to go through about calculating what I was expected to make given my degree choice, so I would know how likely it would be that I could pay it back. I don't know if this is a mandatory practice, but it's something that all college students who plan on borrowing money, traditional or non-traditional, should have to consider before taking out loans. A great place to look for this information on the worth of your potential degree program is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. If you follow the rules in the first section about degree selection, you shouldn't have much of a problem anyway. This next point is key. Do as much coursework as cheaply as you can. You can do a large chunk of your degree 
at a severe cash or time discount. First time college students right out of high school don't typically think about the fastest or cheapest way to graduate. They don't think about the money because at that age, most don't have a reference point for borrowing that much money, let alone figuring out how to pay it back. They don't worry about finishing college quickly because they're too busy enjoying the college experience. On the other hand, adults aren't worried about dorm living, campus events, and frat parties. Adult students are keenly aware of how much money it's costing them. Here's a collection of things I researched, attempted, and did to reduce the amount of time and money spent on my bachelor's degree. First, use the college level exam placement CLEP test to cover as many prerequisite classes as possible. Collegeboard.org runs CLEP and they provide a cheap way to get some credits out of the way. I spent a lot of time studying and building my knowledge other subjects so I could simply take a CLEP exam to get credit. The exams aren't free, but last I checked, they were $85 a pop, and that's much cheaper than even a community college credit. Plus, you won't have to sit through class just to get your degree. So make sure your potential institution accepts these credits because they don't all do before you pursue this path. Next, do your best on the math and reading placement exams. Almost all colleges have the option to take a placement exam when you go back to school. Make sure to take advantage of this. Most kids gloss over these, but you need to take these exams seriously as an adult student. Testing out of basic English and placing into the highest level class available can save you thousands of dollars and an entire semester's worth of classes. Take advanced placement exams. Now, this one you probably didn't even think about is highly viable. When I was back going back to school, I ran into an interesting challenge. Some of the schools I was interested in didn't take CLEP. However, they would take AP credits. Even though I wasn't in high school, I didn't let this stop me from figuring out a way to take the exams. I messaged every AP coordinator in my area that I could find after using the internet to find them. I explained to them my age, situation, my plan, and my level of preparation. I think I messaged maybe 10. I remember two got back to me, one to tell me that it wasn't possible because I'm a man and they're an all girls school, and another to tell me that she would allow it. After preparing for them extensively, I sat for the AP exam in both physics and calculus. I was a 27 year old man in an army uniform. I had National Guard drills that day, taking the test in a room full of high school students. Unfortunately, I didn't score high enough to grab credit for anything, but it taught me a valuable lesson. Most rules and limitations are only suggestions. I don't know if I'm the only adult student who thought of taking AP exams to get credit. Based on everything I read and researched, I'm likely one of the only ones to ever go through with it. See where credit is offered for SAT and SA2 two scores. I came across some schools that offer credit if you achieve a certain school score on the SAT or SAT2. There are no rules that say you can't take these exams as an adult. As long as you pay collegeboard.org their money, they don't even care if you show up for the exam. If your degree program offers credit for a certain score or on any of the SAT exams, I strongly recommend picking up a study book and registering for the exam. You can save yourself a lot of money and time if you're willing to do the work and take the test. Take classes online if you can. Believe it or not, I once took a public speaking class online. I didn't want to take the class, but it was the most insidious type of school requirement. The type that the school wouldn't accept any transfer credit for. So I had to take it at the school. The good news is that online classes are notoriously easy for the most part. You can find the answers to many homework and test questions online. Am I advocating that you cheat? Absolutely. Because in the real world, you can look up answers to problems you can't solve. Also, challenging classes don't exist online for that very reason. Or if they do, the exams are proctored in person. But seeing as the university system is still making students pay for classes irrelevant to their field of study, we need to get past these classes as quickly and painlessly as possible. If you feel bad about approaching irrelevant online classes in this manner, just remember, were it not for these classes, you could finish your degree in half the time and likely at about a fourth of the price. They're basically robbing you. I hope that puts your conscience at ease. Talk to the professors at your school about placing out of classes. During my return to school, I took a semester off to focus on boxing. I was worried about falling behind on my graduation trajectory, so I talked to my professors about studying on my own and taking the final exam to get credit for the class. They told me that as long as I didn't communicate with them about academic matters during the semester, I'd be able to take the final exams and get credit for the classes. I got them to give 
me the PowerPoint slides for the semester notes. The classes were thermodynamics and quantum mechanics, and they sent me on my merry way. Complications came up and I never followed through, but I got the okay in writing, that's important. This was yet another sign to me that the rules are flexible if you're willing to work. The main lesson from this section is that if you're willing to ask questions and not make assumptions and take the rules at face value, you can save a lot of time and money. You may think of other things I didn't mention on this list to help you get ahead and finish your degree program faster and cheaper than most students. Side note, every suggestion in this section works because for the most part, grades don't matter. Don't kill yourself trying to be the best student or get the best grades. Just pass the classes and get on with your life. Only how you perform in the real world is what matters. Four, the life experience and perspective advantage. When I went to school at 18, I was not emotionally ready. When I tried to get my degree the first time, there is no way around it. I should not have been to college. I was an 18 year old who never left home and fell in with the drinking and partying crowd. It wasn't until I got a little older that I realized how typical this path is for a lot of high school graduates. Uh, when you're an adult in college with a little life experience, you aren't interested in many of the distractions plaguing the typical student. As an 18 year old, I regularly missed class because of a hangover or didn't study because I wanted to party. As a 30 year old, it would just be weird if I was out drinking with my classmates. Your reason for being in school is different than your classmates. Many of them are there just because they're expected to be there following the typical high school path of college. You're there with a definite purpose. When I was in school as an adult, I was simultaneously a college student along with boxing professionally, drilling for the Army National Guard, running my website, writing a blog and speaking, interning. I could handle all of this because of my superior time management. Despite being busier than most people and definitely busier than most students, I was able to manage my time and energy because I didn't waste them on anything that didn't contribute to my goal. If you're worried about how you'll manage all the work and your other responsibilities, then you'll have to get creative. Lean on friends and family to help you. Eliminate all distractions that do not contribute to your goal. Once you do this, you'll be surprised at not only how much help you'll be able to find, but how much time you have to get finished with everything once you're not focused focused on anything else. So here's a quick recap of the things you should know before returning to school at 30 years old. Make sure the degree program is worth it. Figure out how you'll pay for college. Do coursework as quickly and as cheap as possible. Use your life experience and position to your advantage. A lot of going back to school is just hustle, grit, and seizing opportunities. If you want it badly enough, you'll get it. Everything in this video comes down to being motivated to work hard. Remember, no one ever improved their life by approaching things with low intensity and just going through the motions. Good things comes to those who hustle. Stagnation stays with those who wait. As always, the rest is up to you. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps.